to say that there was no information around. It was worse. There was a lot of misinformation around. And of course, I was the kind of person that as soon as um, I it intuited anything, I was at the library, I was looking it up in the index of books. Uh, I don't know, remember where I first encountered the word homosexuality, but I certainly remember in my elementary school, uh, while I was still in elementary school, looking up in the various you know, indexes of psychology books by Eric Fromm, and um, I even came across something by the notorious Dr. Burglar, on, uh, who um, has since become kind of a, a demon of the, um, you know, of the gay liberation movement because he was one of the people who you know, was quite convinced that um, if you were homosexual, you were, you were doomed to die you know, horribly. And Eric Fromm was no better. I remember reading a passage in the back of some Eric Fromm psychology book. Uh, homosexuality was, was consigned to an appendix. And he ex said, explained in no uncertain terms that if you were homosexual, eventually you would become an alcoholic and kill yourself. This was not, no, and it wasn't, it wasn't a case of this was something that you might do or that you most do. This was something that you would do. All homosexuals were alcoholics and committed suicide. You know, he knew this as a fact, and he presented, and I thought this was a rather startling thing to discover, uh, you know, about yourself when you were, you know, 11 years old. Atlanta's Model 1924 is, is kind of an experimental novel. Uh, it is set in 1924, but you know it's an experimental novel because it's got these sort of funny things where, you know, things are printed in two columns and, and, and it looks bizarre on the page. You know, you can see it looks funny on the page. We know it's an experiment. Uh, uh, the book takes place, as I said, in 1924, 1923 and 1924, and it more or less is based on some stories my dad told me when um, he, um, about when he first came to New York City. Uh, he came to New York City from North Carolina, and indeed the name of the main character is Sam, and yes, all of you know that that's my name, but what's important to know is that it's also my dad's name. Uh, so the, the sections that I read you are part of the experimental sections, and they kind of leap back and forth from North Carolina to New York City. Here, Louis said, under the moon-mottled magnolia, it's my journal. It's got everything I don't want Sam and you to know about. It. Go on, look. But when John opened the cover, Sam peering over his shoulder, it was in code. Two columns, one barely comprehensible, the other complete nonsense. You don't want none of them Jew boys to get a hold of this, John said. They could figure it out on you. John borrowed a mule from one of the older boys down at the Aggie barn and rode it up to the house, big boots flapping at its slate-colored flanks. Mama ran out to shake her apron at him. Get him out of here, get him out. Boy, what do you think you're doing? He gets in my Swiss chart and I'll skin you alive, so help me. Sam had heard her swear like that maybe twice in his life. That's probably why he remembered it. The mule jerked to the side, and John slipped right to the ground. Then Mama started laughing, splayed on the grass. John was laughing, too. Get up from there, John, Mama called between hysteric eruptions, and get him out of here, while the mule wandered over to the porch steps and ate a hollyhock. John said, they could figure it out on you, but chuckling, Louis wandered away barefoot over fallen blossoms as if codes and journals and secrets and ciphers had ceased to interest him as he searched the spring night. On the top third floor, Hubert's was around the corner from Mount Morris Park. I got to wash up. Sam put the suitcase on the rug's foot faded red, looking around the first of the two small rooms. Sure, with his shoe, Hubert pushed the wicker trunk under what would be Sam's bed. Unless you want to wait until we get uh, later, till we get over to Elsie and Corey's, they got hot water. 
That's all right. I want to do it now and change my clothes. All right. Hubert took the wash basin out from under the corner sink. Here you go, but you've got to hurry up before Clarice gets here. Using Hubert's yellow bar of kitchen soap, lathering his arms, his buttocks, his knees, hopping now on one foot, hopping now on the other, Sam washed in cold water. Sometimes he glanced at Hubert, who sat in the wing chair. Hubert's forehead furrowed, furrowed above his glasses as at the corner he paged through the book, views of something. Hubert was one of three colored teachers recently hired to teach first grade at the colored all-boys public school only six blocks from here, Hubert had explained to Sam. That tall body cut tobacco in Connecticut, that strong body sat so straight when he studied, and there had been... Miss Hutchinson told me about a trick she used when she taught them rough boys in the colored schools outside Cincinnati. She said if it would work for a woman, it would certainly work for me. Just as she told me to do, before classes began, I procured an old cracked baseball bat, and on the first school day, I brought it in with me before any of the scholars arrived. Before going in, I hid it on the curb outside the school till it cracked more. I then took it into my classroom and leaned it in the corner by my desk. When the boys came in, they were loud and lively and full of high spirits. Within five minutes, while some of them were still taking their coats off and playing tag around the room, one of them asked me, what's that for? Sitting at my desk, I looked over folded hands and said in a firm and resonant voice, I had some trouble with one of the boys in my last class, and I'm afraid I broke my bat on his backside. And by the way, you must learn to call me sir. They all turned around, eyes about to bulge out of their brown, round faces. And while I called them to order and they rushed to sit, you could see them squirming on their benches, each attached to the desk behind. Their eyes kept going to the bat in the corner, their little behind stinging in anticipation. You knew they were wondering how it felt. <laughs> about the bony wreckage of the Thanksgiving carcass, Everyone was laughing far too loudly for Papa to go on, as here he put down the letter a moment to touch his clerical collar. Mama took her wire-frame glasses off and dabbed her eyes with a napkin. Sam hopped and shook quickly from his mind another memory, an animal. The crate's slats smithereened across Hubert's shoulder and dragging the chain across the gravel where the grass had worn from around the pump. Hubert cowered back. Papa, no. He remembered his father's grunts, precise and ugly. Hopped again and scrubbed at his groin, finally to squat among the splatters over the dark floorboards and maul the bald rag first over, then under his outsized toes. Hubert, did you really do that thing with the baseball bat? Hmm? Hubert asked over his book. What? Oh, sure. Only I didn't think I really had to. Miss Hutchinson, when she did it, she was teaching big, rough country boys. Field hands right in from picking cotton. They were all field niggers. Wasn't a house nigger among them, she told me. A lot of them were too old for high school anyway. She said some of them were older than she was. And there were a few who just didn't want to take no guff off a woman. But my boys are just children, and city children, too. He dropped his eyes to the book, raised it a bit from his lap. Views of Italy. Sam wiped the splatters up and, still squatting naked, turned to pull the wicker from under the daybed. You mind if I smoke me a cigarette? Go on if you want. But like I say, finish up before Clarice gets here. She don't approve of smoking. Only on opening it and pushing aside shirts, and underwear, which he didn't really wear unless Mama insisted, did Sam see the folded paper bag with Jules' soap. Hubert, don't let me forget this when we go over to Elsie and Corey's. Taking a bar from the bag to leave Hubert, Sam put bag and bar up on the pink quilting, translucent as Isenglass, the bar's paper immediately unfolded like a thing volitional. 